And welcome back to the Career Hacking Village. We talk a lot about doing technology, but we never really talk about how do we present, how do we get things moving forward. And I'm really excited, I was really excited to see the proposal uh, submission from my friend Peter Keenan to just really talk about hacking security leadership. So Peter, take it away. Thanks so much, Kathleen. Uh, and thanks everybody for watching. Um, yeah, this is my first DEF CON presentation, so thanks, thanks for accepting it. Um, all right, um, the obligatory who am I slide. So um, I have been in the uh, information technology and information security space for about 30 years. Um, you can see from these pictures, there's uh, at least three de decades of bad haircuts there. Um, I'm currently the Chief Information Security Officer for a global financial services company. Um, you all are hackers, you can figure it out if you really want to, but I'm not allowed to use the name, so I'm not going to. Um, prior to the five and a half year stint I've had there, I was uh, uh, global head of information security governance at Citigroup, which was, uh, yeah, I owned a bunch of things like global information security policy, uh, I was a director with PricewaterhouseCoopers and their information security consulting group. Um, I owned a firm that did uh, information security consulting for about a decade, primarily to military and intelligence agencies and spent a little time working in government service before that. Um, yeah, like I said, all in a lot of time in the space and um, I have hopefully boiled down what I've learned in the last 30 some odd years into about 30 slides, which sounds terrible when I say it that way that I'm, I'm getting like one slide a year, but sadly it's true. Um, yeah, two kids, 24 and 21, 31 years of marriage. All right, so I'm gonna start with this CISO mind map. Uh, I think it's a great slide. Um, I think this chart is really informative sort of about the things that somebody in my position is thinking about on a daily weekly monthly basis um, the area of this mind map that I'm going to focus on is selling information security I think it's the area that people struggle with most as they transition their career from sole contributors or engineering types or very technical sort of roles to a leadership role. And it's probably the most important part of information security. If you boil information security down to its core nugget, the thing that's probably um, describes it best as, is influence without authority. And the ability to drive security through an organization without directly being able to control people's comp or control their um, uh, you know, performance reviews and all of those sorts of things is really the challenge that we face. I mean, some things we have direct control over, but by and large, we don't. And, and we need to be able to convince people that this is the right thing to do, both for their own personal gain, the company's gain, society's gain, all of those things. Um, and, and that's why I think that's probably the core function that information security, probably the most important function within information security, because it's a force multiplier. We can get the folks in the company all pulling in our direction. It multiplies our effectiveness dramatically. The thing I don't like about this part of it here, and, and you know, maybe it's just me misreading it. I think the authors, like I said, did a great job. It feels like it's a lot of top-down selling, right? And I think that that's good and it's important and it's what you know, lets you keep your job as a CISO, convincing the, you know, the, the board and the CEO that you're doing a good job and security is important. You got to do that. But if you actually want to fix security at an organization, you've got to sell it from the bottom up because it's the people on the ground, the people at eye level who are actually doing the things that will make you more or less secure. And you've got to convince them that this is the right things to do and, and, these are the changes they need to make in their processes to be better. And you've got to provide them with ways of doing it that makes them more efficient, not less efficient. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's a hard sell in a lot of cases with security because, you know, um, being frank, we're introducing overhead quite often to do things securely, right? I mean, the, the act of typing a password as opposed to just being on the system introduces overhead. But short-term overhead, long-term overhead, it obviously creates a lot of problems not having passwords. 
Amazon S3 buckets, yes. Um, all right, so jumping ahead, the key language of business, and, and again, something that for me, I think is one of the really big differentiators between a sole contributor and a leader in the information security space is the language of risk. Business leaders understand it. They may not understand your specific technical um, domain and, and they may not understand what a router or a switch is, but they understand the language of risk. And it's a language that we can meet in the middle with them on. We can meet in the middle with lawyers, with accountants, business people, the CEO, they will all get the idea of likelihood and impact. It's, it's a problem for us in technical fields. In, in the words that I've, I've highlighted on this page, uncertainty and probability, we struggle with that as a group. We do. We're, we, we think about these things in absolutes like engineers. And I, and I know that's a rough way of saying it, but you know, it, too many times, it's really a struggle to drag an estimate out of somebody who's, who's in a technical discipline. They want to have the right answer. With estimates, you're basically saying, I'm giving you the wrong answer, but I hope it's close. And that, like, that, somebody who's got an engineering training or a mathematical training, that like makes the hair on the back of their neck stick. What, it, it would stick up. What, what do you mean? I, I don't know the answer. I, there's no right answer. I'm just thumb in the area. I, I, I'm putting that in front of the CEO. Yeah, you are. That's what risk is, is you take your, you know, the best educated guess you can sometimes about the likelihood, which is a soft number and the, you know, um, and the impact of these events occurring. And that's the way that you have to describe them. I often hear people say this phrase and it drives me nuts. You can't predict the future. Absolutely. You can. I mean, with 100% certainty, no, but I, why else would we eat right and exercise, right? Because we, we don't think we're going to die in the next hour. We don't think we're going to die tomorrow. We don't think the world's going to end tomorrow. We don't think um, they're going to have miraculous cures for diabetes and, and obesity tomorrow, right? That's why we save money, because we think that we're going to live to an age where we're going to need money, right? There's a million predictions about the future we make every day, all of us do. And I think we just have to get comfortable with that, that, um, that you, know, you, you know, you can't predict it with 100% certainty, but that's okay. You have to be able to get comfortable with the uncertainty and probabilities and presenting your risks in that way. And um, yeah, it, and it's got to be done. You know, if you, if you look at the way the businesses report, these things, they all know that they're not 100% accurate. And people will yell at you when your risk is way off. But End of the day, you were clear. It's a, it's a, it's an estimate. All right. Oh, uh, two other things. Well, not last thing on this one. This is one of my pet peeves about information security folks when they're talking to to um, non security folks, lay people. FUD is the biggest the biggest thing that drives me nuts. And you you see it. The salespeople do it. The engineers. When they get frustrated, they do it. They just throw out these FUD bombs of like, well, you never know. Could be the Russians, those Chinese. You know, it's just um, stop. Don't do it. You will, it may work in the short term to win that short term argument, but you will lose respect from everybody in the room. And that's, that's one of the things that defines you as a leader is being able to command, hold and command that respect over time. All right. Risk strategies, these are some of the, uh, the terms that you have to understand if you're going to communicate in risk. Risk reduction, this one's pretty straightforward, right? Um, you know, I have a thousand systems that are MSO867 vulnerable. I patched 999 of them. Have I reduced the risk? Yeah, probably, right? That's risk reduction. Um, there's still a risk out there that I missed one or that the patch isn't isn't uh, fully effective or uh, somebody didn't reboot after the patch or all of those things. But um, that's what that's about, reducing the risk associated with, with some uh, adverse event out there. Acceptance. This is another one we struggle with uh, as technology folks. There are sometimes the business is gonna, just gonna go, yep, that's okay, I get it. I get it, there's a, you know, you say there's a 10% chance that this website will get hacked. I'm okay with it. It's only up for 30 days, I'll take that risk. Um, and we're all go, 
you, you know, it makes our heads explode, but absolutely, that's their call. Your job is to identify as best as you can quantify and report that risk. It's their job to say yes or no to that risk, right? The CEO, whoever's in charge of that business function, they get to decide that. And, and I know there's a, there's a great cartoon about there, you know, uh, you know what's, what's the magic word to get what you want? Risk accepted, right? And, and you know, there are some people who will overuse it, but um, that's, that's in a well-functioning organization, that's how that should work. Avoidance, um, we're gonna go through some examples later, but the classic one is just don't be in that line of business that's gonna create that risk, right? Don't launch that website that um, you know tweaks its nose at some uh, hacker collective or, or 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 yeah any of those sorts of things. Avoidance is is pretty straightforward, um, and, and there are times when we're, we're going to want to advise that. But again, business may just say, "Yeah, I understand. Avoidance is probably better, but we're not going to do it because it's too much of a, a gain for us in business." And I've I've seen a million cases where they were right. I counseled don't do it. And they said, well, we're going to make $300 million off of that. So we're going to do it anyway. Um, and, you know, they were right. Um, transfer, risk transfer. This is the classic uh, cyber insurance, right? And that's, um, I, you know, I think there's a lot of uncertainty around cyber insurance at this point, but this is the classic way of dealing with risk. And I think this will get better over time. And the last one is probably the most common in this area, and that's hope. You just hope you don't get hacked. Um, and you see it over and over and over again. Every day you see, you know, tons of people putting stuff on the internet and, um, you know, just hoping that bad things don't happen. Um, all right. So I have a cat and uh, she shares this office with me, so there's nothing I can do. Um, yeah, there's no risk avoidance on that. Um, this was her office for the last five years, and I've only been working here for the last couple of months. So she'll pop in and out of frame on the background. Um, yeah, her name is Schrodinger. All right. So um, risk, appetite, and tolerance. These are some other uh, terms that you're going to need to know to speak the language of risk. Risk appetite is the amount or the type of risk that your organization is willing to take. You, thank you. Um, Every organization is going to have a, disc, a different risk tolerance level. Um, it, it's very much um, organization specific, right? Financial services tend to be more risk averse. Startups or tech companies tend to be more risk favorable where they'll just take chances, um, particularly if you're a startup, right? I mean, what have you got to lose? A lot less than a hundred and something year old global investment bank, right? I mean, it's just that those are the sorts of decisions that they're going to make. Your job is to understand what the risk appetite of folks is. And, and um, the, the, the description below is great because this is the tricky part. If you could just say, what's your risk appetite? And people could say seven and you Ooh, seven. Um, there is no numeric value like that. Um, everybody's going to have a different definition and you're going to have to speak to a lot of people and you're going to have to deal in fuzzy terms to get a sense for um, how people want to deal with this, right? Whether or not they, um, they want to be able to say, um, you know, it's a dollar value or none, right? Like, you know, the CEO is going to be like, no, what do you, what do you mean getting hacked? You, you're saying you, you want to know how often I want to get hacked? The answer is never, right? I mean, like, you know, I can get hacked for free. What am I paying you for if we're going to get hacked, right? Um, CFO, he's probably going to set aside some money for this and say, yeah, I put aside $8 million a year. So if you can exceed that, let me know and we'll budget some more for next year. Um, you know, and the, everybody else is going to have a different view of it. Your, your job is going to be to consolidate all of that and come up with a, a security controls that are appropriate to those risks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, risk impact levels. This is, this is an interesting diagram and I think it's a great way uh, after you've had all those conversations, to communicate this back to the folks, right? To communicate this back to senior leadership and say, based on what I heard from all of you, and this is just an example from the site that's listed below, these are the sort of numbers or um, metrics I've come up with to um, calculate our risk levels, right? Whether something's a low impact, medium impact, or high impact and get everybody to just sort of nod yes so that there's at least a common understanding of the term, right? It's a lexicon that will help you build um, common understanding and get people 
you know, it, it, when, when, when a bad event occurs, everybody sort of freaks out initially, but then you sort of can go back to this and say, listen, this is what we agreed to. This is in line with what we've communicated to the board, to the CEO, and it gets everybody back to, to the at least level set. All right. Managing cybersecurity risk and, and preparation. So these, this is just a framework that I like to use for how you would do all of these things, right? You've got to build a team, um, diversity on that team, so important from all aspects of it, right? The type of people, the type of education, the type of functions that they've served. The more viewpoints that you have on your team, the better you're going to be. And, and um, this is another thing that I see a lot of technical folks, and I've been guilty of it in my past, we, we hire people that look a lot like ourselves, right? And, and I don't mean that necessarily physically, but like I'm an infrastructure guy, that's where I come from. I love routers and switches and networks. And, um, you know, early on in my career, I, I thought those were the people that were, knew the most because they understood the things that I understood. And as I've grown, I think um, I, I tend to gravitate more towards people who know things that I don't. And um, I just ask them questions all day, every time I meet with them. and and. Um, I think that's made me a better leader. And I think that's probably the most important part of building a team when it comes to risks, because you've got to understand it from every angle if you're going to manage it effectively. Structure, you've got to assign formal uh, responsibility for these things. And I know a lot of people say risk is everybody's responsibility. Yeah, but if you say it's everybody's job, then it's nobody's job. It's got to be somebody's job. It's got to be somebody's responsibility. And you've got to give them the freedom and the ability to actually manage uh, around that risk. Managing the risk, we talked about a bunch of these things already. Understanding your company's cyber risk profile. How likely are you to get attacked? How often? Who's going to come after you? What is, um, what is your risk appetite? What is the impact of you getting hacked? Is it, you know, the type of business where Congress is coming after you? Is it, you know, all of those things have to factor into your management of risk get as many viewpoints from the outside, law enforcement, your peers, industry groups as you possibly can, and then constantly updating your, your, your uh, profile, uh, your, your uh, processes so that you're in integrating the latest and greatest techniques to be managing this stuff. And the last part of this, probably the most important, what do you do when you're wrong? When, are, when, when you've calculated all of these things, and the worst still happens. Have a crisis response plan. I think during you know this year, it's like if anybody is arguing this point, you got to go. What are you thinking, right? I mean, like we've had all of this craziness this year. I, I live in you know New York City, and it's just you know I, I can't you know we were waiting for locusts, right? I mean, it just it, you know everything went wrong, and and um, if uh, if you can't sell this now, you should probably think about moving jobs, right? This is um, as important as anything uh, could be at this point, right? What do you do when you're wrong? All right. So I'm going to jump into a little bit of psychology. And I think um, this is one of the areas, again, that I think technology people, and, and I hate making generalizations, but I feel like I'm, I'm talking about myself here. So I, I, I'm I've lived with this my whole life. We're, we're, we're not great sometimes at empathy and we're not great at understanding people's motivations. We know what they did um, and maybe technically we know why they did it, but we don't know emotionally why they did it. And, and I've, I've spent the last probably 15 years really focusing myself on trying to develop that part of my, my, my personality so I could understand why people make the decisions that they do instead of just going, what the hell is wrong with you? What were you thinking? I'm actually trying to ask, hmm, that's interesting. What were you thinking? Instead of what the hell is wrong with you? What are you thinking? So um, this, um, this chart, I think it came from a Bill Gates presentation a while ago. Um, I love it. I, it. You know, if you ask people what they're worried about, like what scares you? They'll be like terrorists, murderers, you know, um, all these things that just are very, very, very sharks. People are worried about sharks. Kidney sharks? I, the, the chances of getting hit by, by, by getting killed by a shark, like, are, are, are you stand a better chance of, of 
buying two winning lottery tickets while getting hit by a meteor than you do of getting attacked by a shark. Um, if you look at this chart, you can see some of the reasons for it, right? You know, the media tells you, you know, media doesn't report about people having heart attacks. They report about terrorism. Terrorism sells newspapers, right? I mean, like, um, it's such a rare event. Those aren't the things you should be worrying about. And, and in the information security space, there's lots of this, right? People talk about Stuxnet a lot. There's one Stuxnet, you know, and there's, there are APTs out there and, and some of us have to deal with that. It's really rare. It's really rare. Chances are you're going to get owned by a mediocre um, ransomware crew. I mean, that's just, you know, probability overwhelmingly that's who's going to own you. And, and we certainly had a lot of evidence of that this year. And, and I think um, there's a couple of biases at play here that I'm going to talk through in a little bit more detail. Public service announcement on this stuff, though, it freaks people out. When you reveal to them their cognitive biases, it pisses them the F off. Like people will get really, really mad at you when you highlight this stuff to them. Um, they killed Socrates for it, basically. So, you know, this is not new, but it's absolutely true. People do not like to deal with the fact that they have cognitive biases. So public service announcement, use this internally in your inside voice. Don't necessarily communicate it to the folks in the room. I love this graphic up in the, in the corner here, though. I mean, people have been talking about, like, how uh, social media is being used to change our politics. And um, this, you know, most of you are probably too young to even know what a TV guide is, but this TV guide from the 1980s basically had the same message about television, right? I mean, it's not new. This, you know, the foreign state actors are controlling the elections. Eh, it's just, they've been doing, you know, it's, it's old hat. We've seen this a million times. All right, so. If I can get my presentation to work again. All right, here we go. Um, why are people so bad at estimating risk? The optimism bias. This is the first one of the biases that I'm going to talk to you about. Um, it, it's really funny. This, it's not really funny, I guess. But when you, you ask people, what are your chances of getting cancer? Um, they'll give you a number, right? Estimate your percentage chances of it. And they'll say something like 10% or 60% because they, you know, most people have no idea. Um, if they say 10%, the, the answer is 30%, right? It's like, it's, you know, we have so much data on this. We know how many people get cancer. We know what percentage it's, you know, it's pretty, pretty solid, right? Um, it's 30%, right? 30% of people get cancer. And, but if people underestimate and say 10%, and then you give them the answer and say it's 30%, they'll go, nah, for me, it's 10%. And you go, why? I just feel that way. But if they say it's 60%, and then they learn it's 30%, they'll be like, oh no, yeah, no, I'm better than that. I'm like 20. They'll adjust dramatically if they overestimate, but not if they underestimate. And I think this bias carries through in all aspects of our life where nobody thinks that they are below average at anything. And it, it, this, is, this is like a psychological fact you can prove over and over again. 90% of drivers think they're above average drivers. Right? which is, you know, demonstrably false, of course, but um, there's very few people who admit they are a, a below average driver. And anybody who spent any kind of time on New York City's roads will know that that is definitely not true, particularly among the taxi set. So um, how does this translate to information security? Uh, I, I, I've linked to a report that I, um, I, I did some work on, and I, I was part of the uh, advisory team for this ESI Thought Lab piece, which was published about a month ago. It's a great report. Uh, I'm not just shilling it because I was involved with it. I actually think it's great, but uh, you can read it and make your own determination. There's some great data in there about um, what the chances are of having a breach. And they did a lot of great work around looking at the, you know, the entire universe of companies and what percentage of them actually suffered breaches during the previous year. And if you go with the uh, moderate or material level, um, people estimated 45% said, you know, that was our chance. And it's way higher. It's almost double that for a lot of industries, their chance of actually getting breached. So people do not believe they're going to get hacked. Even after they've been hacked, they will still believe their chances of getting hacked again are way lower than they actually are. And it's just a cognitive bias that you have to get people past. 
why are people so bad at estimating risk? Availability bias. This is the second one. And this is, you know, got a couple of my favorite examples in it. Um, Australia's national terrorism threat level is probable. And, and if you look at the data, um, I think like two people had been killed in terrorist incidents in the 20 year period in Australia. I, I, it's like, I don't think you know what the word probable means. I mean, like it's a terrible, it's a terrible things are terrible tragedies. Every one of them horrible and shouldn't happen, but that, that's not what the word probable means, right? And, and I think um, we struggle with um, these things that are emotional and impactful like that and estimating them in sort of cold calculated terms so that we can get an accurate perception of risk. And, and nobody wants to say that, that's ridiculous. A terrorist attack is not probable, right? It's just, you know, it's, it's just, it's emotionally, that it just doesn't make us feel good to say things like that. And there's a bunch of other examples here, right? Like the shark attack one um, is just my favorite, like 186 in 20 years among 6 billion people. I mean, that's like, that's less, I, I don't even know how to describe that as it's so infinitesimally small, right? Um, yeah, I guess I could do the math and actually come up with a number, but it's really, really small. And, and um, you know, if you look at like, the, the, there was this huge warnings about Zika and I mean, it just, it was very, very small. Um, and I think we have to take those things into perspective. And this is what keeps us from getting into the FUD area when it comes to information security look at the numbers, look at the data and figure out um, what the real risks are and what, what really is probable and what really is likely and what really isn't. And um, yeah, the good news is we generally don't have to deal with, you know, people dying and all of that kind of thing. It's just like a computer getting hacked and some guy losing money or something. So it's not, it's not as serious and it's not as emotional, but it still is. I mean, people, people will generally, you know, you get hacked in a material way. People are losing their jobs, right? I mean, it's just, that's sort of the way that, that works. And, and people will get emotional and defensive about it. Like I said, when you expose a cognitive bias, it's like, ah, it makes their head explode and they freak out on you. All right, learn helplessness. This is the other one. Oh my God, I see this one so often. Um, they're like, why are we patching? Everybody gets hacked anyway. What's the deal? Who cares? You know, like everybody gets hacked anyway. It's not like I can stop these hackers. I mean, like there's a big group of people who think the hackers are all powerful and they can't be stopped anyway. So why are we bothering? I mean, at least three times every, every time I teach information security awareness, at least one person comes up to me and says, why are we bothering? Everybody's getting hacked anyway. Like I click, you know, you can't stop people from clicking. Why are you bothering teaching this? And um, it's just the wrong way to look at this, right? You, you, nothing is ever perfect. Nothing in life is perfect, um, but you can make it better. And, and that's the message that, that you have to communicate to folks that it's never going to be perfect, but we can get better every day. Um, yeah. Um, I'm not sure whose quote that was at the end of this, but it's great. Um, you can't spend your way out of cyber problems. It's like exercise and eating, and eating right. Um, you just have to wake up every morning and do it. And, and that is absolutely the truth. You can't buy enough things to fix cybersecurity. You actually have to do the work. And, and that's hard for people to accept. Um, and I think, um, yeah, it, it takes a while to get people over that, but you know, there's no, I'm going to patch and be done. It's, you're going to patch today and you're going to patch tomorrow. And, you know, they're going to feel like Sisyphus pushing that rock up the hill and waiting for it to roll back on them. But that's, that's sort of the game. Every patch Tuesday is the Microsoft Sisyphean rock coming to roll, roll over you down the hill. This is so weird. I feel like I should stop and ask for questions, but there's nobody to ask questions on. All right, so we're going to keep going. Um, Anybody who hasn't read Cliff Stoll's book, The Cuckoo's Egg, please stop listening to me right now. Go buy the book and read it right now. This is absolutely required reading for anybody who wants to develop a career in information security, particularly if you want to be a leader. It's unbelievably still prescient about, you know, this happens in the 80s and people are using analog modems and dial-up terminals and TTY, green screens, the kind of stuff that I grew up on. Um, but it's still really, really 
applies to today. All of the same principles apply. And he has a great quote from, from a SANS conference not too long ago. Um, this was in 2017, where, where he's talking about, you know, how he, was, he found these guys in his system and he was trying to convince people they needed to do something about this. And he said, well, I thought all I had to do was show them the data and they'd understand. But it turns out I had to, I had to tell a story. And that's what people will respond to is a story. And, and absolutely, um, he learns that lesson. And I think as we, we read the book, um, we do too. It's a great read. Cannot recommend it highly enough. Absolutely, uh, you, you, should, you should go and buy and read that book. All right, here's some thoughts I had about selling I, uh, security to IT. You think, well, we're all technology folks. We've got a similar mindset, so this should be easy. And it's not, it's not impossible, but it has its challenges. Very different mindsets. IT people, they care about uptime, costs, and user experience. Um, they, they, that is what they get comped on, right? That's what they get paid on. What was the uptime? Did they deliver the features? Are the users happy? I don't want to say they don't care about security, but it's, it's not one of their goals, right? I mean, like they'll tell you it's one of their goals, but it's really not. It's, you know, it's one of the things that's adjacent to their goals. And we have to convince them that security will help those three. And there's a few strategies to do that. Um, and you gotta get them over the, the hurdles of some of these things here. I got a firewall. I bought a firewall, I plugged it in, I'm secure. But there's an any any rule at the front of it. Why would they sell me a firewall that isn't secure? Why would Cisco do that to me? It's like, you know, that's that's not how firewalls work. That's not how life works. But um, yeah, you ha you have to do the work to get them through that. Um, they'll tell you about their audit and regulatory reports, all of these sorts of things. Um, and and your strategy for selling them is going to be to show them. It's gonna be a story, but it's gonna be a story with data, right? I think pen tests are a great way to do this, where you show this guy walking through their environment, right? And you gotta make them as close to real life as possible. I think there's a big part of this where you're gonna to need to convince them that that data is not manufactured and all of those sorts of things. And you're gonna to have to help partner with them, right? You, you can't throw them under the bus, you can't sell them out to audit. Sometimes you have to, but you generally, those, you want those to be your last resorts. You want to help them and enable them to make themselves more secure without affecting their uptime too much, without affecting their ability to deliver features, and without driving their costs through the roof. I think this is one of the things we're really bad at security is we push that cost. Hey, we were cost neutral this year, but we you know, caused IT to double their, their budgets. The strategies, like I said, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, awful, don't do it. Wrap them out to audit, wrap them out to management. Yeah, the availability bias, just put it in their face every day. That kind of works, believe it or not. Um, demonstrate their fallibility. This is one of those things that will help with the optimism bias. If you demonstrate clearly that they are capable of making mistakes, they'll be angry at first, but Generally, if they're professionals, they'll get over it and want to be better. Metrics, it, it, this is hard to argue with. Patching metrics, fantastic. Just cold, hard facts about patching metrics and then a story to go with it that says, here's you know, MS-0867, you know, here's MS-1710, and if you have this open, this is the horrible things that happen to you, and this is how many systems we have open, and show the trend so that people get a story out of it. Um, pay for it, Get put it in your budget. The more tools that you can get in your budget, and listen, I, right now, we've got in security a huge advantage, right? I think everybody, cyber is the cool thing at the, at the board table. If you ask for money, it's very hard for them to say no. If IT asks for money, it's really easy for them to say no. Um, so I think it's, that's one of the ways that you'll win people over. Um, and, and of course, you're gonna have to have air cover from the board and senior management. All right, selling security to the board. 
this is a challenge, right? I, I think it's not as much of a challenge now as it used to be. I think boards are really focused on this. And I think boards, they want to know, you know, they all know this is a risk. And they want to know that somebody's covering them to make sure that they are doing the bare minimum, you know, not the bare minimum, but they're doing the things that they need to, to make the company secure from, from cyber attacks. Um, most of them don't have a technical background. Almost none of them have a cyber security related background. Um, and you're going to need to figure out ways to communicate to them in fairly simple terms. This is the way that I do it. Um, I, I've got these pretty simple four questions um, that I use and I find it really helps me get the message across in a, in a succinct one slide presentation. And then I usually have some, some details behind it. But I don't want to inundate them with data. I know that some people's strategy is just throw everything in the deck and you know, this way you're ready for any question. I think these four are the only four questions that a board member really cares about, but every board's going to be different. So are we compromised right now? Right. Everybody, this is one that scares security people. Like, how would I know? Oh my God, they're going to, you know, you're going to give them a high, medium and low and some reasoning why you think that. How vulnerable? Again, this is even fuzzier. High, medium or low. And why do you think that? Who might attack us? What would they use and how are we defending against it? Just a couple of sentences. Um, how are we going to address, you know, because there's so much uncertainty in this. Um, how are we going to address that next level of threats? And this is early on in the presentation. I love those maps with the dragons at the end of the earth and the falling off the end of the earth. The, the uncertainty bit, that's why they used to draw those, right? Because nobody knew what was on the other side of those maps. And, and that's FUD, right? The, you know, the dragons at the end of the map are, are, are FUD. Um, yeah. And then what's our plan if we do get compromised? Like I said, you have to have thought through this. You have to be able to communicate this. Um, some of the things that I've got at the, at the back ends of this deck are, are folks who didn't, right? Some examples of folks who struggled with that. All right. I'm going to move along a little bit here. Um, yep. Here's some, some, some other examples of things that you can communicate to the board. Some metrics, agree on metrics, make your metrics consistent and show a trend over time. That's what they're going to understand. They're not going to know what an attempted attack means, but they're going to want to know, am I getting more? Am I getting less? Are they getting better? Are they getting worse? Those are the sorts of things that a, that, that a board and senior management is going to want to understand. I think this is another great way to report risk. Um, how is um, you know, high, medium, low uh, on risk and impact on our core risks? What are those core risks around cybersecurity that we face? And what's the trend? What do you view the residual risk after the controls that you've put in place? It's the difference between inherent risk, which is the risk as it stands naturally, and residual risk, which is the risk after the controls and mitigations you've put in place to deal with that risk. All right, so here's some case studies. Everybody probably remembers this. H.B. Uh, Gary, um, CEO of the company, got up there and said really bad things about Anonymous and how he was all up in their business. And um, this ended really, really badly for him, right? He taunted Anonymous and they went through him like a hot knife through butter. They owned, every, they owned him three ways from Sunday to wiping his personal iPad at the end of the attack. I mean, it was just... Um, completely unprepared for the, the onslaught that, that came his way. Um, yeah, it, um, there's a great video, if you ever have a chance to Google it, uh, on, um, uh, geez, uh, on YouTube, I can't remember the guy's name, but one of the late night comedians does about this hack on HB Gary, it's fantastic. Um, so the other one that I'd like to talk about here in the same kind of group is, is Sony Pictures, right? And, and this got all wrapped into politics, but end of the day, they made a movie that was poking the eye of the dictator of North Korea, right? The, the, you know, and you just go, is that, you know, risk avoidance. Somebody should have said, you know, you could just call it something else, not North Korea, and you wouldn't piss these guys off so much. Um, again, they went through these guys like a hot knife through butter, and they owned them three ways from Sunday, released movies, dumped all their emails. It was just horrible. Um, and, you know, the, if you look at the common elements here, they were engaged in an activity that was not universally admired, right? I mean, you pissed somebody off. 
management didn't understand how dangerous that adversary was. The information security controls were not up to the task of defending against somebody who, you know, is very well prepared to attack you. And the attackers have all the advantage in that space, right? So, um, you know, from then, and then, you know, obviously neither of them was prepared with any kind of response once this had happened, right? None of them had any kind of a, uh, a, a disaster recovery or, or recovery strategy at all, it seemed, to deal with these things. You know, they were both on pen and paper for months afterwards, supposedly. Um, you know, and the responses were, were, you know, followed the standard script there at the bottom. Right, so here's our, here's our lessons, you know, from, this is my view of it. Don't pick fights with people who have nothing to lose. You know, you have everything, I mean, literally, they have nothing to lose. You have everything to lose. That's dumb, right? Um, private companies with, you know, profit loss calculations, if they go against people who don't, that's going to end badly for you, right? They got all the time and energy in the world. They, you know, if you give somebody that, that much leeway, they're going to get through. Um, know your enemy and yourself. No cybersecurity presentation is complete without a Sun Tzu quote. All right. Um, just some questions to think about, right? There's a great statement in, in the Sony um, case that came out maybe a year before. It's a valid business decision to accept the risk of a security breach. I will not invest $10 million to avoid a possible $1 million loss. That's a valid statement. The problem is he was totally wrong about the amount of loss, right? I mean, totally, way, way hundreds of times off, off, off base on the, the order of magnitude there. And, and that, was, that was the issue. Want to cry and not pet you, um, and I think I'm wrapping up my time here. So I'm going to I'm going to talk through these next few slides um, fairly quickly, and I'm I'm happy to chat about these uh, afterwards. I'll be be uh, on chat. So um, obviously everybody knows what these were from 2017. Big worms, MS 1710 spread through the networks. Want to cry was an amateur version. Not pet you was like you know. Somebody who knew what they were doing said, hold my beer, watch this, and just let loose on the world. I don't think it meant to spread as far as it did, but it sure did. And boy, was it a whopper. Um, it taught me a few things, right? Patching is not optional, right? And I think IT will tell you, why would I patch? Every time I patch, I lose 2% of my systems or whatever percent of my systems. Um, and, and here's why, right? Um, you, you just got to patch everything. And, and it's not the same as it used to be where you had security through obscurity. Shodan's out there, man. And, and, and they can scan your whole network in seconds. And they will find every single one that you didn't patch. So patching 99% is only marginally better than patching nothing. Because they'll find that 1%. And then, you know, if, if you got hit with, with, with not patch you, was it. They just needed to find one. And... Um, you know, there's a bunch of other things here that are pretty relevant, like email, having email. So it's not connected to the internet, but it's got email. That's the same thing. Maybe it's low latency, you know, a high latency network, but it's still on the internet. Um, yeah. yeah. Why is patching so hard? I think we covered it, right? Some other questions to think about. I think these are the sorts of things to me, these questions are what lets me get inside the head of the people in IT and the people in management so that I can better understand the problems they're going with. And, and, and hopefully this is a helpful exercise for you. Well, and again, I'm, I'm willing to talk and chat through any of these things with anybody, but um, this, is, this is the sort of thinking that will get you to that high empathy state so that you can relate to why they're having problems and maybe help design solutions instead of just, you know, flinging vulnerabilities at them, which is fun. I, I absolutely, but, um, actually helping solve the problem will actually increase your, your company's uh, risk tolerance. All right, Equifax, everybody knows this one. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time recounting what happened there, but let's just say Congress gets involved and, and if you're a private company and Congress starts interviewing you on Stude, that's about as bad as it gets, right? Um, you're up there and they're going, eh, they're wagging their finger at you, that's not a good thing. Um, and sort of the same results that we were talking about before. Patching 99%, only marginally better than patching one. You know, the, the CEO at one point was saying, it was this one guy in the test unit who didn't patch his server, and that's why all of this happened. 
and and it's like dude you're missing the point if you think that right you don't have a process that covers your entire organization it's on you um yeah and and he i think he went to jail and a couple other people like because they all sold stock as soon as they heard the breach that's lesson number one if you're involved in a breach stop selling or buying stock <laughs> absolutely do not do not Planning for an incident. This is another one where they were totally unprepared. Right? I mean, it was just, it was like comical to watch those couple of weeks afterwards. It was like, oh my God, what are they doing over there? Um, yeah. Some more big questions to think about. And, and the one that I like here, um, and, and I'm as guilty of it as anybody, right? This was victim blaming, right? Everybody was like, Equifax, you're horrible. What if somebody showed up at their offices with a gun and stole the files? Would we say the same thing? And I don't know why this is fundamentally different, but I guess it is. I don't know. But I mean, you wouldn't expect them to have armored personnel carriers outside their office and all of their staff wearing bulletproof vests so that they could fight off the guys who came in with a gun to steal the files. But we expect that from them in a cyber realm. And, and um, but it's, you know, read the terrain. That's the way the world is, I guess, right now. But, but I, I, that, those are the sorts of things I think about when I read these things. All right, it's a couple of documents and I'm gonna wrap up because I'm, I'm probably gonna get yelled at pretty soon. Um, this is a great document on what it takes to become a leader. There's a link to it on the bottom. Um, the Cybersecurity Guide for Leaders in Today's Digital World from the World Economic Forum, fantastic document. These 10 things, like just absolutely nail it for what you need to do to get to a leadership role in cybersecurity. Um, best practices. These are the best practices from the ESI Thought Lab piece. Um, again, I think really nails it. A different take on it because I think it's from CISOs themselves as opposed to folks on the outside, but fantastic. It really gives you some great examples of what you could do to uh, improve uh, any cybersecurity program. This is a method that I like. Uh, I've used it for a long time for um, how to build a cybersecurity strategy, sort of what's the funnel look like, what goes into that process, uh, what are the things that make up um, the levers that drive your cybersecurity strategy. All right, putting it all together, um, these are my closing thoughts. Everybody talks about APTs and nation state elite hackers. Um, yeah, they probably could get through because they have unlimited time and budget, but they probably don't care about you. That's not where I would spend most of my time. I mean, you got to do, it, but um, you know, chances are overwhelmingly you're going to get attacked. You're going to get owned by some chintzy ransomware gang uh, out, of, out of nowhere, Bill. Um, if management makes bad decisions, there's not a lot you can do other than be prepared with a, with a response plan. Um, your job is to tell them when they're making bad decisions. Even if they yell at you and say, why do you always shut down my plans? Because your plans always suck. No, um, you, you have to do that. You have to have the emotional courage to say, this plan is stupid. And I'm going to tell you this plan is stupid. I'm not going to stop you from doing it, but I'm going to tell you that it's stupid. Um, yeah, it, vast majority of this stuff, almost all of it, like almost all of these things happen because we suck at inventory and patching just suck at it. And I think the basics, and, and everybody says this, and it drives me nuts when I hear it, because it's like a platitude, but um, if we could patch our stuff and we knew where our stuff was, 99% of this stuff wouldn't happen. If we did that and put MFA on all of our logins, almost, it would be almost impossible. I, like it would be really, this would be really, really hard. Um, you know, I say that and then they'll figure out 10 ways around that stuff. But if we were just effective at this stuff, we would take off so much of the low hanging fruit. Um, yeah, and these are the five rules about uh, how to manage cybersecurity risk. Assign responsibility, identify and quantify the risks, mitigation strategies, communicate. Like I said, tell them when they're doing something stupid and make sure you highlight the risks and plan for when you fail, right? Because everybody's gonna fail and you're gonna be wrong. You're gonna be wrong, they're gonna be wrong, everybody's gonna be wrong sometimes. You gotta have a plan to deal with that. And that's it for me. I'll hang around and chat and answer questions. Peter, thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful. And I miss the cat. I wish the cat would come back more. But um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. 
No problem. In addition to Peter being in the chat to talk about this topic, he's also going to be available for career coaching. So be sure to check out the schedule that's pinned in the Discord channel to sign up to be uh, coached by Peter. Peter, it was great seeing you. I'm sorry I have to cut off and, and go to the next one. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.